we are gathered here to reflect on a subject very interesting, which goes Asia toward resilient peace, the role and challenges of diplomacy. For this, we have a keynote speaker from Foreign Ministry, Vice Minister Lee Teo will deliver about 10 minutes keynote speech. After that, we have four uh, representatives of uh, important countries. First of all, we have James Choi from Australia and Ambassador Harry Harris from America. Then Ambassador Nagamine from Japan and Ambassador Reiter from European Union. Uh, the title is uh, somewhat uh, confusing because resilient peace is rather uh, unfamiliar to us. I looked into the internet and this uh, type of diplomacy was tried in Western African countries where important challenges happen, but there is no framework for uh, endurable peace. So they wanted to uh, lay down the uh, possible uh, frameworks to increase peace in that region. So I think somebody in the foreign ministry uh, thought of that, that experience and changes happening in East Asia, or rather uh, Pacific India, then we look into uh, mobilize our wisdom to find what could be the best way to promote peace and prosperity in this region. So with that uh, explanation in mind, I'd like to invite Vice Minister Lee Teo to deliver a keynote speech for this session. Thank you very much, Ambassador Choi. Uh, Chai Youngjin, uh, moderator of this session. Ambassadors, dear colleagues and distinguished guests, good afternoon. I'm very delighted to be here with you uh, at, at the 14th uh, Jeju Forum. Do you hear me, by the way? Okay. So it is a bit better like this. Uh, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the ambassadors who have come here for this diplomatic uh, round table. My warm welcome and deep thanks also go to all the participants. Let me start with uh, one study about the history of war and peace. According to this study, it is estimated that the recorded history of mankind dates back to 3,520 years ago. And uh, during that time, Mankind lived free of war for only about 280 years. In other words, people have waged wars for a total of 3,235 years, representing more than 90% of the entire span of recorded history. War was natural, and peace was something to make. Moreover, we came to realize as history unfolded, that maintaining peace is as difficult as that of making peace. To borrow a terminology of physics, peace exists as an unstable equilibrium. Uh, once we deviate from peace, we tended to move further away from it. We needed to add a specific vector power in order to go back to the equilibrium. Peace is as fragile as glass. It can be easily broken if we are not vigilant enough. In fact, what has happened in Korea is a case in point. As all of, you, all of us gathered here know, uh, there has been a repeated pattern of tension and hope on the Korean Peninsula in the last several decades. Permanent peace is yet to come. Given the current international political landscape surrounding the Korean Peninsula, I believe it is very timely and relevant to talk about resilient peace in Asia. Resilience is a vector power, which I referred to a moment ago, uh, that can bring us back uh, to the peace when we are not placed at the handle 
or a vertex of the bell-shaped bell -shaped parabola of international politics. Resilient peace is not something that comes naturally. We need to work for it. In this regard, I would like to suggest as your food for thought for today's discussion, four elements that may play a role of ingredient for resilient peace in Asia. First, in order to realize the resilient peace in Asia, it is of utmost importance, in my view, to achieve a sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula. Peace on the Korean Peninsula may not be a sufficient condition for resilient peace in Asia as a whole, but it is surely a necessary condition. The sporadically heightened tensions and conflicts on the Korean Peninsula have posed major threats, not only to Asia, but also uh, to the entire world. Fortunately, last year, the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, Winter Olympic Games, uh, made a warm spring breeze blow across the Korean Peninsula. And the ensuing peace process has made progress. Three inter-Korean summits and the two U.S. North, Korean, North Korea summits have been historic breakthroughs. After the Hanoi summit in February, the dialogue between the United States and North Korea has yet to be resumed. And early this month, North Korea launched short-range missiles. These recent, recent developments generated concerns among some people regarding the future course of the ongoing peace process. Nonetheless, I would like to emphasize the fact that despite the recurrent crisis on the Korean Peninsula in the past, Koreans have kept on moving forward. In close coordination with the United States, building on our ironclad alliance, the Korean government will continue to work toward a peaceful, nuclear-free Korean Peninsula. The second element for the realization of resilient peace in Asia will be facilitating people-to-people -people exchanges and boosting economic interactions among Asian countries. Enhanced people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges and increased economic interactions among countries may not by themselves prevent conflicts, but can serve surely to strengthen mutual understanding among peoples and mutual understanding is conducive to the building of a mutual confidence. Cooperation and confidence building may generate a momentum that can enable us to bounce back to peace and overcome any unanticipated tension or discord. It is therefore imperative to promote cooperation among Asian countries. As far as Korea is concerned, this idea is embodied in its new southern policy and new northern policy. With these policies, Korea hopes to contribute to building a community of peace and prosperity beyond the Korean Peninsula, where all people in Asia live together and thrive in harmony. With ASEAN and Eurasian countries, we wanted to work together to expand the scope of cooperation that will lead to peaceful and prosperous, prosperous future that starts from the Korean Peninsula. The new Southern policy pursues three Ps, namely people, prosperity, and peace. It seeks to build a community of peace and pros prosperity with a people-centered perspective where all members are better off together. Various cooperation programs are being implemented. Such projects are meaningful, not only in terms of yielding economic benefits, but also in terms of nurturing a culture of mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. The same is the case for the new Northern policy that encourages our cooperation with Russia and Central Asian countries. Third, I consider it imperative to institutionalize practices of cooperation among nations if we wanted to make peace resilient. For cooperation among four, cooperation among nations Rules are needed, and enhanced cooperation creates rules among nations. The multilateral rules uh, thus created become a basis for institutionalized practices of cooperation. In this regard, Europe 
is an exemplary case. We can draw valuable lessons from the European experience. After Europe had gone through two great wars in the 20th century, they were persistent in the post-war years in fostering and institutionalizing cooperation within the region. I believe that likewise, practicing and institutionalizing cooperation will pave the way to resilient peace in Asia. Last year, President Moon Jae-in proposed the building an East Asian Railroad Community. As the European Union started from the European Coal and Steel Community, the East Asian Railway Community will also evolve into an East Asian Energy Community and an East Asian Economic Community, putting in place eventually a multilateral peace and security system in Northeast Asia. The proposed Northeast Asia Platform for Peace and Cooperation is also intended to consolidate and institutionalize cooperation by accumulating practices of dialogue and cooperative endeavors among countries concerned within and without Northeast Asia. Lastly, I should not forget to mention another important element of peace and shared prosperity, that is the spirit of embracing others. You may call it sharing the value of inclusiveness, if you will. This is acknowledging that others may be different from me, uh, but they can work with me. Uh, this spirit could serve as a basic value upon which multilateral rules get based and resilient peace is built. When states and people embrace the spirit of inclusiveness, they will be able to engage in mutually beneficial cooperation. When the outcome of cooperation turn out to be uh, mutually beneficial, the cooperation will continue and lead to building a system of cooperation. In other words, institutionalizing cooperation. This will be the basis for sustainable peace and shared prosperity in which all live well and in harmony. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have talked about the four elements that could be helpful in realizing resilient peace in Asia in an attempt to provoke your discussion. All these things cannot be done in a day, nor will the work of just one country be sufficient. It is possible only when all the countries concerned, including the countries the ambassadors are representing here today, fully participate in concert and with patience in the common efforts toward building sustainable peace on the Korean Peninsula, expanding cooperation in Asian region, institutionalizing cooperation and sharing the value of inclusiveness. I look forward to hearing valuable ideas and insightful web thought from you while we walk through towards our common vision of resilient peace in Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vice. Thank you Vice Minister Lee Tae-ho for your version of resilient peace in Asia. We pay particular attention to his uh, underlining the rules-based international relations, especially including uh, North Korea. You are now on the North Co uh, Korean Peninsula, and uh, in terms of uh, the chessboard of international relations, Northeast Asia is at the center of the world. You see, uh, Korea, we have military alliance with the United States. We have 28,000 American troops on South Korea. We have China, rising power, and Japan, a third greatest economy in the world, and Russia is there. So in terms of international relations, uh, politically as well as economically, North Korean Peninsula is at the center of the world. With this in mind, uh, we listen to four ambassadors here. Uh, we have uh, 74 minutes, and each representative can spend five to seven minutes for their remarks. And we'll try to identify uh, several salient points we can discuss among ourselves. 
then I think we still have enough time to open the floor for you to ask questions. Thank you. Uh, James Choi. Thank you, Ambassador Chair. And um, it's a wonderful opportunity and a privilege and honour to be here with such a distinguished range of speakers, my distinguished colleagues, but also Vice Minister Lee. Thank you. It's also daunting to follow your very eloquent and um, comprehensive overview of the issues that we face in the international system. I'll just reflect on my own personal experience. I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade 20 years ago, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And as a junior officer, I thought that I was swept up in that moment of the end of history. Everybody was thinking that the liberal international order would be dominated by that unipolar moment of US power underpinning the international system and that we all become international citizens and we'd all beamed up to the Star Trek and we'd all be universal citizens with universal values and how far we are from that truth now. 20 years on in my diplomatic career, I don't think I've seen the issues but also the international system in so much a state of uncertainty. I think the international system is going through a major um, change or shift defined by lack of certainty and uncertainty certainty is coming the norm. And if you look at the words that we describe in the international system, it's been framed now in terms of a zero-sum game and not in terms of win-win outcomes. We're talking about major power rivalry and very little, few commentators are talking about the values of multilateral principles. We're look, looking at competition between co uh, co uh, countries as opposed to cooperation. And certainly in Northeast Asia, but also I think Southeast Asia or the Indo-Pacific and globally, um, it's been defined by increasing US-China tensions. That tension is really defining and changing the international system. You only have to look at the headlines of today's newspapers, the increasing trade war between US and China, and the prospects of these dynamics turning into a longer-term Cold War. You only have to look at the headlines regarding 5G and Huawei and its role, and whether this is going to trigger a, a new technology war, internet becoming a, a dividing line between those who create a free open internet or a different type of internet. But then you see other terms that are redefining the international framework, Belt and Road Initiative, China's activities in South China Sea. We're talking about competing views of the world and how we're going to shape the region. And even some commentators are looking at the possibility of US-China tensions emerging into a split or a decoupling of US and China relations. And in that context, there seems to be increasing pressure for many countries in the, the world to pick a side, to choose one side over the other, to either say, you're going to be with one system or the other. And the pressure is being brought to bear, I think, in many countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I know that one of the themes of this topic at uh, session today was about the importance of diplomacy. And I think in my recent career in diplomacy, Diplomacy has never been more important. Certainly for Australia, our whole foreign policy is focused on promoting our national interests, while at the same time focusing on our values, the values that make Australia prosperous, democracy, a vibrant, free trading country, engaged in the Indo-Pacific region. Australia certainly wants to be able to preserve a, a range of choices for our diplomacy, so that there is no need to choose one side over the other. For Australia, we have a strong alliance with the United States, which will continue to be the bedrock of our security. At the same time, we have a strong economic partnership with China. China remains our largest export market. At the same time, we have a deep and long-standing relationship with our ASEAN partners. And certainly ASEAN, as it continues to grow and becomes more confident in its own diplomatic reach, become even more important in the Indo-Pacific region. Australia also has very strong relations with Japan and indeed the Republic of Korea as like-minded democracies in the region. And even more important will be India's role in the region as it continues to grow rapidly. And that's the reason why Australia is placing a focus on recasting our foreign policy priorities on the Indo-Pacific region. Because previously we've been focusing on Asia-Pacific as the concept. 
but to, we need to now in, encapsulate and encompass India in the new regional framework uh, to reflect the changing economic weight, but also the reality that Indo-Pacific will be the driver of future international order. But I'll also touch on what Vice Minister Lee said, the rules-based international order. I think that's less advertised in foreign policy priorities for many countries because, frankly, our security and prosperity has been underpinned by the rules, the institutions, international law, the alliances that have underpinned free trade and prosperity over the last 70 years post-World War II. And certainly Australia is committed to promoting the principles that respect those rules that can, will continue to def, um, underpin lasting peace. We continue to work through regional institutions such as East Asia Summit and APEC to develop the common good. We need to continue to resolve disputes through dialogue in accordance with the rules and established institutions. And certainly we want a world where all states, regardless of size, have equal treatment, where rules discipline power it means that we focus on cooperation, not unilateral action. It means competition within the framework of international law. But it is a reality that China's power continues to grow. China will play a larger role in shaping the region and the world. But certainly from Australia's perspective, we want China to fill that leadership role in a way which strengthens the international order. Likewise, we will continue to encourage the United States to continue to play its very important role in engaging in the international order and indeed the Indo-Pacific region. So diplomacy is more important than ever. And I certainly believe that history is not deterministic. We're not fated to competition or indeed conflict. But that said, if diplomacy doesn't play its part, we will revert, revert to a world divide, uh, defined by power and certainly the Greek historian Thucydides put it neatly when he described a system of power as the strong doing what they will, the weak suffering what they must. And certainly diplomacy is required to avoid this outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Choi. Uh, you underlined the importance of partnership. There is no need to choose between the rivalry countries, and that sounds uh, uh, similar to what Vice Minister Lee said about his mentioning of inclusiveness when you lay out the framework for Asia's future peace. Uh, with that in mind, let's go to Ambassador Harris. Thanks uh, very much. Thanks, Ambassador Chang Jen, for that uh, uh, introduction uh, and for your remarks earlier, and uh, Vice Minister uh, Lee Tai Ho for that terrific uh, opening uh, speech. Uh, Ambassador James Choi, Ambassador Nagamine, Ambassador Ryder, uh, it's great to be with all of you here at the panel today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the least experienced diplomat that you're likely to ever see. Um, so uh, my colleagues up here agreed that they would take uh, your hard questions and leave all the easy ones for me to take. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, gentlemen. I really am. Thanks. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Jeju Forum uh, for the invitation to participate in this roundtable and for the opportunity to address uh, this distinguished audience. Uh, now, when I learned that the topic of this session uh, would involve exploring how dipl diplomacy in particular can help establish lasting peace on the peninsula uh, and in the region, I was encouraged because I truly believe that diplomacy plays an indispensable role uh, in advancing foreign policy uh, interests abroad and in maintaining peace, not just for the United States, but indeed for all of us. So the Academy for American Diplomacy publishes a journal titled The First Line of Defense, Ambassadors, Embassies, and American Interests Abroad. In it, they chronicle the work of American diplomats abroad and advocate for diplomacy as an essential aspect of foreign policy in engaging in increasingly complex, disorderly, and dangerous uh, post-Cold War period. So as a military veteran myself, uh, who now has the distinct honor as serving as the U.S. Ambassador to South Korea, I have to say that I couldn't agree more 
uh, with how important diplomacy is to setting the conditions for peace uh, and then preserving it. Over the past year and a half, we witnessed here a truly astounding flurry of diplomatic activities by our governments as well um, uh, uh, by uh, all parties in the region. Starting off with the Pyeongchang uh, Winter Olympics, as Ambassador Lee, or as Prime Minister Lee uh, talked about, um, three summit meetings between ROK President Moon Jae-in and Chairman Kim Jong-un, and two summit meetings between President Trump and Chairman Kim. Developments that were really unimaginable just a short time ago, perhaps a short time ago as when I served in uniform. Building on the trust that President Trump and Chairman Kim established in Singapore last year, we made progress uh, in the Hanoi summit. Now, while we, didn't, while, while we didn't reach an agreement with the DPRK, we have exchanged detailed positions, narrowed the gap on a number of issues, and made clear that the United States expects complete denuclearization before sanctions relief. The U.S. and the international community have a shared understanding of what final, fully verified denuclearization entails and what meaningful progress toward that goal looks like. Unfortunately, the North Korean position in Hanoi fell far short of that understanding. However, the U.S. remains ready to proceed in parallel with denuclearization with concrete steps to transform the U.S.-North Korea relationship and establish a lasting peace regime on the Korean Peninsula to meet one of uh, the earlier conditions. So over the last 66 years, the U.S. and the ROK have laid a strong foundation upon which we construed, constructed rather an alliance and a myriad of connections that continue to deepen and evolve. The coming decades, I believe, will take us even further. In facing the threat posed by North Korea and many other challenges, our close cooperation and our shared values make us strong. Ours is a relationship with striking manifestations of military, economic, cultural, and scientific cooperation, but most importantly, it's a relationship infused by deeply shared values and interests that depends heavily on strong diplomacy. And it's a relationship that I'm sure President Trump will hail as a key part of our efforts to maintain peace and security in this region when he visits Korea at the end of June. So ladies and gentlemen, I've talked too long, and I know we're going to hear from other panelists as well. So let me conclude my remarks here. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our discussion uh, session after the remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Perry, uh, Harris, for your defining Korea, serving Korea uh, as in the first line of defense that uh, reminds me of uh, your famous defense perimeter before the Korean War, which goes from Aleutian Islands to Japan, Ryugyu Island, and the Philippines, now included Korea in your defense first line. And which is quite reassuring in terms of how, how we act in cooperation vis-a-vis -vis North Korean nuclear weapons. I think we can all agree that we have uh, to have complete denuclearization of North Korean nuclear weapons before uh, sanctions uh, relaxation. But on this point, uh, while other ambassadors do not mention on this particular aspect, we can discuss uh, when you, uh, we have discussion session. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Nagayami. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Ambassador Choi, um, for moderating uh, this um, panel. And also, I, I uh, thank uh, Vice Minister Iteho for the um, keynote speech to set the kind of agenda for the discussion uh, today, and I also appreciate all the um, fellow ambassadors of Ambassador Choi, Ambassador Harris, and Ambassador Leitler for active participation in this very interesting panel. I am truly gratified to come back to Jeju uh, Forum again. I think I have, this is my the third uh, appearance in the uh, Ambassador's Roundtable, 
that means that uh, this is my third year in uh, servicing uh, in Korea as a Japanese ambassador. Uh, I'm continuing to have a very uh, challenging days and weeks and months, but uh, I'm doing my best. And uh, this uh, Jeju Forum seems an ideal place for us to discuss peace uh, in Asia and beyond, as the Jeju Island is uh, known as a place of peace you know, uh, uh, for itself. And so let me uh, uh, discuss some of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the subject uh, related to the, the, the theme, uh, Asia towards resilient peace. Uh, let me first uh, uh, start with uh, talking about uh, uh, North Korea. Um, as already been uh, uh, discussed, that uh, the past uh, one year has been a very significant, uh, you know, year with significant events uh, taking place between the United States and uh, DPRK uh, to. Uh, and the summits in Singapore and Hanoi, and the three inter-Korea summits are held in Panmunjom and Pyongyang. We, as at Japan, highly evaluate the diplomatic efforts by the United States and the ROK governments for our, uh, trying to realize the denuclearization of uh, DPRK and building peace. Japan, as a, a very key player in the region on this very important uh, matter, we have closely cooperated and coordinated with the United States and ROK and other regional stakeholders, and for that matter, the international community in order to keep international efforts into the same direction, and we'll continue to make efforts for realizing the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The recent state visit of President Trump of the United States to Japan provided another occasion at the highest level between Japan and the United States to coordinate fully and the policy towards the North Korea. Concerning uh, Japan's uh, relationship with the uh, North Korea, uh, I will tell you that the Prime Minister Abe uh, recently repeatedly expressed uh, his determination to meet up with the Chairman Kim Jong-un with no condition. And so we are open to do our utmost in order to resolve nuclear, missile, and importantly, abduction issues uh, with North Korea. In order to resolve the abduction uh, issue, we are prepared to directly uh, face the North Korea and actively engage in re resolving uh, those issues. Government of Japan will continue to strengthen cooperation and uh, uh, coordination with like-minded countries such as the United States, ROK, and others in order to make the North Korean implement its commitment to com uh, of complete denuclearization. Secondly, let me uh, turn to the issue of peace and prosperity in wider regional uh, space. Uh, since 2012, uh, Prime Minister Abe's administration announced and exercised a major diplomatic objective, so-called diplomacy that takes a pan panoramic perspective of the world map. And also, on the security side, we have a, a general uh, direction of uh, uh, proactive contribution to, to peace. Um, I'd like to remind you that uh, in Japan, as a part of such an effort, uh, we are hosting a G2, G20 uh, summit uh, towards the end of uh, next uh, month and uh, uh, in Osaka. And uh, G20 has uh, mainly an uh, economic uh, uh, agenda uh, there, <coughs> but uh, uh, economic agenda and also global issues. Uh, but this year, 
uh, we have decided to organize a foreign ministerial meeting of G20 towards the latter half of this year. And uh, when it comes to some of the bilateral relationship, certainly Japan-US alliance has never been stronger than it is today. Well, as I mentioned, uh, symbolized by the President Trump's recent visit to Japan uh, between 25th and 28th of May. And two leaders discussed uh, on North Korea, um, the other part of uh, the region, including China, and uh, you know, the whole Asian situation. And uh, we really appreciate the U.S. presence in Asia and the engagement and commitment to Asia. And also we share the concern about the situation in uh, East Asian Sea and the South, Asian, uh, South China Sea. And furthermore, um, of course, uh, we have uh, other important uh, contacts in the region with a bilateral uh, context in order to, to uh, realize peace and prosperity into the future. Well, in this connection, I'd like to just uh, to mention uh, the concept and uh, the activities related to free and open Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, we are, in this context, uh, we are cooperating closely with Australia. And as uh, Ambassador Choi uh, mentioned, that uh, India is now a key player in this uh, endeavor. Well, I would uh, just explain the evolvement of the policy. Uh, back in 2012, when the Pre Prime Minister Abe's uh, administration came to power, we had uh, as uh, uh, the basic foreign policy objectives, um, uh, you know, diplomacy, the, the importance of diplomacy with a global and panoramic perspective. And then uh, also, as I told you, the proactive contribution to peace uh, on the security side. So these two concepts get together and then sort of move us to a concept of free and open Indo-Pacific. And the idea is to combine Asian continent and uh, African continent uh, you know, to you know, future uh, uh, they, they, uh, to have a future, very bright future in uh, pro, uh, prosperity and peace. And also, uh, it is a concept of connecting the oceans, Pacific Oceans and the Indian Oceans together uh, by the same kind of uh, notion of free and open uh, space. Um, the working objectives uh, up, uh, upon the, the concept of uh, free and open in the Pacific, there can be three dimensions. One is the uh, promotion and the establishment of rule of law. So it's a, as uh, Ambassador Choi said, that the rule-based uh, order need to be uh, created uh, by way of rules of law and the freedom of na navigation and the free trade and those uh, concepts. And the second pillar is an economic uh, prosperity through partnership and connectivity in terms of uh, physical connectivity and the human uh, connect connectivity and also institutional uh, connectivity. And the final part is that the peace building uh, through the capacity building on, for example, an enforcement efforts of a maritime law and the humanitarian assistance and the disaster relief and so forth. So uh, actual working objectives and the projects and the plans are underway, are underway uh, under the, uh, these uh, working objectives uh, based upon the free and open India Pacific. Um, let me... Um, uh, come back to uh, bilateral uh, context uh, a little bit uh, by referring to Japan-ROK uh, relations. Um, 
two countries, Japan and ROK, uh, need very close cooperation for keeping a good coordination over the issues related to North Korea and enabling peace in the region. And uh, currently, uh, the bilateral relationship is faced with um, difficulties, uh, mainly stemming from the handling of the issues related to the um, foundation or framework of uh, mutual cooperation. Um, now, we established the, uh, re-established, uh, if I may, the uh, diplomatic relationship in 1965. And then we have an agreement to cement that kind of foundation. And uh, that, that we have an issue related to that foundation. And more recently, Japan has proposed a bilateral consultation and also a, uh, you know, the proposing the, the, the issue into the uh, arbitration uh, process. Um, the, we are faithfully following the way to settle the issues by way of uh, the um, uh, dispute settlement uh, mechanism embodied in the uh, existing agreement. So we very much like to resolve those issues so that uh, we would be able to uh, uh, work fully in a full-fledged manner for building peace and prosperity in the region uh, and also have a great bilateral uh, relationship to grow into a more future-oriented uh, the, the, the phase. As you know, that uh, Japan has got the new uh, era, uh, era of uh, Leiwa. Uh, as of the 1st of May, the new emperor uh, uh, was enthroned, and then new era's name was uh, 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 selected as Leiwa. And Leiwa in Japanese means a beautiful harmony or, be uh, or peace. So um, the Japanese, uh, Japan and Japanese people are very much sort of refreshing the kind of uh, the spirit of uh, uh, welcoming new era of uh, Leiwa and then seeking for peace and pros prosperity to the future. As you know, the next year we are going to host the um, uh, Summer Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games, certainly during the time of the Olympics and the Paralympics, we want to have a time of peace and a lasting peace and resilient peace to the future. So I, I just uh, finish my first uh, initial remarks here, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Nakamine. Uh, we take note that uh, you mentioned Japan has uh, uh, efforts to contribute to problems proposed by North Korea. We fully appreciate it. And you mentioned the regional perspective, including free and open Indo-Pacific area. Then uh, you mentioned, of course, ROK-Japan bilateral relationship. And uh, we opened the floor. Uh, some of you may ask questions on this particular point. And regarding Indo-Pacific uh, peace, uh, the, the concept mentioned by Ambassador Australia and Ambassador Japan, uh, we have to include, in a way, the concept of China, how to deal with this problem in this concept. We can open this question when we hear from Ambassador Raito. Ambassador. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I share with Ambassador Nagamine my third appearance here in, in Jeju. So it's always my pleasure to be back. And uh, uh, the, this year's theme, resilience, is uh, one I think which fits uh, particularly well with the European Union. And I will uh, take up the issues uh, the Vice Minister Lee has, has mentioned, uh, the European integration, functional cooperation, multilateralism, rule of law, I think these are the important ingredients. 
I would also like to underline from the very beginning that uh, we see in the European Union the security of Europe and the security of Asia closely intertwined. We may be separated by geography, but not in terms of security. And uh, I will join uh, tomorrow uh, the High Representative at, at, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, where she will have a discussion with the uh, Defense Minister of Korea and with the Defense Minister of Japan. And I think that shows you the particular importance we attach to security in Asia. I think what we have learned, and I will concentrate my remarks basically on the Korean Peninsula, after 2018, where we were all looking forward to smooth movement, we have seen since Hanoi, and I would not say that Hanoi was a failure, but I think it was a, a wake-up call, but which led to a lack of communication again on the Korean Peninsula. Um, I think we see now much clearer what are the challenges for peace diplomacy here on the Korean Peninsula or in Asia at large. Well, while we think that sanctions and pressure will remain necessary to demonstrate to North Korea the price to be paid for breaching international law and obligations. But at the same time, there is no alternative to dialogue. If the international community is to reach a fundamental solution and ensure complete, verifiable, and irreversible denuclearization, it must also walk at the same time through the door of dialogue. The role and challenge of diplomacy is exactly to make that happen. Neg negotiation processes inevitably face periods of crisis, and that's what we experience. The need to build trust when promises are and continue to be broken, the need to take risks, the need to build sub domestic support, these are all factors which potentially can undermine a negotiating process. The summits between the United States and the DPRK and the inter-Korean summits and the relationships developed between the respective leaders present a unique opportunity to take substantive steps forward towards a peaceful and denuclearized Korean Peninsula. Nonetheless, the current situation in the US DPRK relations and the inter-Korean relations shows that the handshake between two powerful men might not always be enough. Experience from other conflicts shows that a multilateral dimension adds resilience, and that's what we are talking about, to a negotiating process. Bilateral talks are always good. They can create change. They can create a positive dynamic. But bilateral talks can also expose negotiating processes to the mood of the day on both sides. The multilateral system creates a sort of safety net for negotiations to be preserved and protected from the hiccups of the moment. Well, we have experienced that in the negotiations leading to our nuclear agreement with Iran. It was also illustrated in one of the first forays into peace building the European Union has met in Asia, namely the Aceh peace process. And more recent examples include our neighborhood, the talks between Serbia and Kosovo. This is why we believe that complete verifiable and irreversible denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula can be better achieved within a multilateral framework that has a bilateral component. If the bilateral com uh, component is framed in a multilateral context, it can help protect the process and can also help the monitoring of any agreement reached. 
Well, now turning to a wider perspective, multilateral processes require a multilateral framework based on institutions. Likewise, Minister, you have, you have mentioned them. And just before coming to this session, I participated in the 20th anniversary of the trilateral secretariat between Korea, Japan, and China. Something to build on, it's in the house. But these processes, they are necessary to uphold the international rules-based order. Yet, just that this liberal international order is needed more than ever as we enter a scarily unpredictable period of history, my Australian colleague has, ref has, has referred to it, where we see that some of the major powers questioning and undermining the pillars, the very pillars on which it rests. Well, as so often in history, the Republic of Korea finds itself juxtaposed between forces questioning the status quo in a manner not necessarily positive for Korea. In the context of the European Union, the, the Union can present itself as a reliable and stable partner. Because the European Union is, and again, Vice Minister, you have mentioned it, a sort of microcosm of the multilateral order in which large and small countries have the confidence that comes from a rules-based order to engage in resilient and sustainable process of negotiation to overcome differences and preserve peace. It should not come as a surprise that the key objective of our main policy paper, the 2016 EU Global Strategy, is to use the, its experience in voluntary regional governance to promote and support cooperative regional orders worldwide, including in the most divided areas, which is an indirect reference to the Korean Peninsula. The security and prosperity of Europe and Asia are, as I have said, indivisible from each other. And as all my colleagues representing countries here, I think we are, they are vital partners of the European Union in strengthening the international rules-based order that has brought us decades of peace and prosperity. And we have built it on what was mentioned by Ambassador Nagamine, connectivity. We have made connectivity as one of the pillars of EU foreign policy for this year and for the years to come. But not only connectivity in the sense of physical infrastructure, but it needs this important people-to-people -people element in order to build trust, because without trust, we will have difficulties in overcoming the situation here. And that's what we have learned in the European experience, in the European integration process. In the session before, it was kindly mentioned that in, in, in 2012, the European Union got the Peace Nobel Prize because what we have managed to do is to integrate in a peaceful manner the East European countries which have come out of the, of the, of the, of the Soviet Union after the, the various falls of, 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 of walls or when we have got rid of iron curtains. Therefore, to come back and to finish, the bilateral negotiating processes concerning the Korean Peninsula in 2018 gave great hope for the future. But this is not guaranteed as we experience right now. If we are to ensure the key concept of resilience and sustainability of the peace process, the leadership and inspiration of leaders seen last year will need support from, a, from multilateral processes. The alternative remains unthinkable. Thank you, Ambassador Reiter. <laughs> we appreciate your insistence on the importance of multilateralism regarding North Korean problem. And listening to four excellent representatives' explanation, I have to 
identify the two questions, one North Korea, the other one China. We, I'll raise these key points uh, very shortly, and uh, without dividing North Korea, China, you can briefly mention your opinion. Uh, we can enlighten audience with your, your valuable opinions. After that, we can open the floor for the audiences. Regarding North Korea, remember in 1978, the U.S. tried to withdraw their troops, President Carter, and our president tried to develop nuclear weapons. We had a choice between the two options, basically proposed by the United States. Economic development, nuclear weapons, you make a choice. Choice for us was very simple because we were already on the road for economic development. You cannot abandon this. We have to uh, devise our future with economic development and prosperity. Nuclear weapons means isolation and uh, uh, you cannot leave nuclear weapons in this region. So the choice was very simple. We chose economic development. The same question is simply proposed to North Korea. To survive, you have to develop your economic situation. For this, you have to abandon nuclear weapons. On the other hand, you have nuclear weapons, you cannot have nuclear weapons, uh, economic development. For this, you have to open up and reform your country, and nuclear weapons does not uh, cooperate with the situation. My question is, simply propose that, suppose that North Korea is unable to make a choice between the two. What can be our, our, our uh, options? South Korea, it was very simple, nuclear weapons, or economic development. We made a choice, very simple, in a matter of a month. In North Korea, we simply ask North Korea to, in the long run, away the nuclear weapons and opt for economic development, which is the, the future for North Korea. But problem is the regime could collapse in the process. In other words, North Korea, the regime, it may be unable to make a choice between the two. What is our option to North Korea? That is my, my uh, point we can discuss together. Second point uh, regarding China, the rise of China and relationship between US-China uh, rapport as well as in the Pakistan, in the Pacific uh, relationship. We all agree that we have to promote democracy, rule of law, human rights, free market in the region, which will uh, ensure uh, resilient peace and prosperity for the future, no doubt for this. But what are we going to do with rising China, especially its relationship with the United States, and reasons other countries may have regarding China, perhaps uh, Australia and Japan, in promoting the concept of in the China, in the Pacific relationship. It's true that they wanted to include everybody. They wanted to uh, open uh, the door to everybody. But still, the concept is there, how to deal with China. My question is, uh, to put this question to you, let's differentiate China from Soviet Union with a simple fact. During Soviet Union and America in the 1980s, the annual trade, annual trade between two countries was $2 billion, $20 billion per year. $20 billion per year. Now, the daily trade between America and China is $20 billion. That means China is integrated itself to the region. You may have doubts, you may have questions, but how to deal with this situation? Let's take a simple example, the question of Hawaii. Korea is caught between the two pressures. America wants Korea to abandon Hawaii cooperation. China wants to maintain the cooperation. With that in mind, is it okay to simply say we want to uh, include everybody and there is no need to choose between the two? Or 
this will come as a real problem for the country in the region. So North Korea and China, simply you can uh, share your thoughts for us. James Choi, please. You asked the simple questions, Ambassador Che. Uh, almost impossible. I think on the issue of North Korea, I intentionally didn't make any reference to it because I, it's going to be a discussion in many other panels at Jeju Forum involving many other experts, probably more expert than myself. Um, but I always reflect on discussions about North Korea because people seem to come to discuss it from a particular perspective based on their previous experience in approaching North Korea. I think you see, you'll see two camps here, those that continue to say that we have to place more pressure on North Korea, and then there's another camp that say we have to try to engage it and we'll change, and that we have to give North Korea the opportunity to change its calculations. Others say it won't change, it won't give up nuclear weapons, it's, or it's unable to make a choice. Uh, we've seen long history of negotiations in North Korea that have all ended in failure, and we have to acknowledge that. But we also have to be clear that nobody really knows North Korea. I, I'm reminded of the quote that Walter Mondale, former US presidential candidate and ambassador to Japan made. He said that anybody who pretends who's an expert on North Korea is lying. And I think he's still, that quote is true to this day. All I can see is that in terms of my own experience of dealing with North Korea on and off for 20 years, it's not about North Korea unable to make a choice, but what can we do through diplomatic levers, through sanctions, through UN processes, through bilateral and multilateral avenues, and through our own engagement and messaging? How do we actually change North Korea's calculations? What are the messages we continue to send to North Korea so that it does change its calculations, that it is indeed unproductive to keep nuclear weapons, that it's coming at a cost to North Korea, especially at a time when Kim Jong-un has clearly said that he wants economic development or economic growth. What are the levers that we can use in our diplomatic arsenal to change North Korea's calculations? And I think we still have to leave that, as many people have termed, a golden bridge for North Korea to walk across if it does indeed want to change its calculations. And that's where diplomatic activity, negotiations, and diplomatic engagement still serve a purpose in North Korea while at the same time placing pressure on North Korea through sanctions and other measures. Um, on China, I don't think I can give justice to that very, very difficult question. The only point I would say is revert back to what I mentioned previously in my introductory comments. Australia certainly doesn't want to be placed in a position where we have to choose between our alliance relationship with the United States or our economic partnership with China. And we made clear to China that we won't accept coercion, we won't accept bullying, we won't accept unilateral actions that place us in a position that we have to choose China over the United States. And that's where diplomatic strategies and where our Indo-Pacific concept comes into play. It's about resilience of the region to ensure that coercion and power does not become, do not become the defining principles of diplomatic action or the international system. It's working with like-minded democracies in the region. We've mentioned Indi uh, India, Japan, but again, um, it's unfortunate our ASEAN colleagues are not here because they're facing the same challenge right now of not making that choice. Mm. And that we have to have an international system that respects the rights of each individual country, regardless of whether you're large or small, and that you're given equal rights in the international system free from coercion. And again, it's that sense of resilience that we have to build in the international system so that all countries have that right guaranteed. Thank you. Ambassador Harris. Yeah, thanks um, very much for those uh, very tough questions, as uh, James said. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll tackle the first one about uh, um, North Korea and then move on to the China issue briefly. So I, I think it's useful to kind of review the bidding on, on where we've been with North Korea. You know, we started out in 1992 with the, uh, uh, the joint uh, declaration that was a bilateral between uh, North and South Korea. And then in 94, we had the agreed framework, uh, a bilateral uh, North Korea and the U.S. In 98, uh, 
uh, sunshine policy by uh, Kim Dae-jung was initiated. Two years later, uh, he received the Nobel Peace Prize for that. In 2003, uh, North Korea walked out of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we started a six-party talks, a six-party framework, multilateral framework. Uh, in uh, 2005 was the joint statement of the six-party framework. And in 2006, uh, Kim Jong-un rewarded all of that effort uh, by exploding his first nuclear weapon. And in 2012, uh, we had a bilateral leap day deal uh, with uh, North Korea, which was short-lived. Uh, and then in 2018, now we have a new approach, I think. And I think that new approach is important because the former approaches are akin to Einstein's definition of insanity. Right? You, you do the same thing over and over again and hope for a different outcome. So President Trump and President Moon Jae-in have tried a new approach uh, starting in 2018 uh, with the uh, Pyeongchang Winter Olympics uh, and then the Panmunjom Declaration, the three summits between uh, Moon Jae-in and uh, Kim Jong-un and the uh, two summits, one in 2018 and one in 2019 between Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, Kim uh, Jong-un. I think that is a new approach, and I think we need to give it time. Uh, we need to give it time to see where it goes. Um, you know, we, we've been at this thing uh, in one form or fashion for 66 years, and it's only been two months, three months, since Hanoi. So we have to be patient. We have to give it, a, uh, give it a, uh, some run time. Uh, President Trump, I think, has been very um, – calm and deliberate, uh, despite the, the recent missile uh, activity, short-range missile activity by uh, North Korea. Uh, he, he, he's still uh, leaving the door open for diplomacy to work, for negotiations to work, for Kim Jong-un to walk through that open door uh, and uh, to move on, uh, move on with the discussion. So I think that's important. Uh, I think that we're not at this point now, at least the United States isn't at the point. Uh, where we're going to re-enter a, a multilateral framework, uh, though we coordinate closely with our allies and partners in the region and in Europe. Steve Began uh, uh, routinely travels to European capitals uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and debriefs his counterparts uh, and to uh, Tokyo uh, and Beijing to debrief his counterparts. So I think that's important. Um, with regard to the question of uh, China, I think it's imp important for all like-minded nations who uh, ascribe to freedom and democracy and the rule of law to hold China accountable. Uh, without going into any de great detail, because I'm running out of my time here, uh, you know, right now we're concerned on a number of areas with China. Uh, Huawei is one. Uh, I think Huawei is a question of sovereignty. Uh, um, it, it's of it's a that uh, degree of seriousness when we go into a full 5G uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think that uh, their activities in the South China Sea runs counter to the United Nations Convention on, on Law of the Sea, uh, as the uh, International Tribunal and the Law of the Sea Tribunal ruled uh, on that in 2016. Uh, and um, I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, what they're doing with the Uyghurs uh, and other ethnic minorities uh, in Western China uh, is shameful. Uh, and we should all rightly be concerned uh, about that. Uh, that said, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time, and I think China can too. It is okay to criticize China, and we should do so because it's the right thing to do for those things that I just mentioned. But at the same time, we should compliment and thank China for their work in upholding the sanctions regime against North Korea. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll stop. Thanks. Thank you very much. Now, Ambassador Yasumasa Nakamine. Well, um, <clears throat> my um, response can be uh, short because I already you know, two ambassadors um, uh, put forward a very important uh, uh, kind of uh, the elements for consolidation. The first issue of North Korea, I, I, the answer is quite a clear cut that, that there is no sustainable uh, peace and prosperity for North Korea uh, by taking a kind of uh, two options together, you know, economic prosperity and nuclear you know, capability may not go hand in hand. So 
the North Korea has to make a, a clear uh, decision, you know, which to take. And uh, the answer is obvious. If they take the uh, economic prosperity, then uh, North Korea will have a, a future um, where Japan can contribute. Back in 2002, you remember that we had a, a Pyong, uh, Pyongyang agreement, I mean a declaration uh, between the then Prime Minister Koizumi and the father to the present uh, leader, um, <coughs> Kim Jong-il, Kim, Kim Jong and uh, in which the, the future of the bilateral relationship has already been laid out. Once the issue of uh, nuclear and the missile and the abduction resolved, then Japan will be in a position to, to contribute for the, um, the nation building of uh, North Korea at that point. So Japan will be a part of that kind of uh, uh, future making you know, by way of uh, concentrating on the uh, you know, uh, economic prosperity rather than nuclear capabilities. And the question of China, I mentioned the free and open Indo-Pacific uh, uh, concept. Um, this is an uh, inclusive uh, concept, not an exclusive concept. The not, nothing to do with, uh, you know, uh, uh, any particular country to be excluded, uh, China, uh, certainly. Unless the participants or the like-minded countries of, under this concept uh, will work with a kind of rule-based uh, activities and rule-based uh, cooperation uh, for, for that matter. So uh, it, it has to be vital to have a, a kind of a commitment for the freedom of navigation and the free flow of things and the rule-based you know, order uh, uh, making, so to say. Uh, we have uh, um, many uh, like-minded countries uh, I, uh, in this endeavor uh, for you know, wider connectivity and uh, cooperation in the region, beyond the regions. So uh, this is something that uh, we want to encourage anybody to join and, uh, you know, uh, and then promote the concept. Bilateral relationship with China uh, for Japan, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, active now, and we have a high level of uh, you know, exchange. The uh, Prime Minister Abe visited China uh, last year, last fall, and uh, you know, so we have uh, ample room for cooperation. Um, but uh, we would like to encourage China to be a uh, part of the endeavor for the uh, maintenance and the development of rule-based order in the region and beyond. Thank you very much, Ambassador Reiter. Thank you. Well, I I already said uh, quite a few things about uh, about uh, North Korea. I just can can add uh, um, one of my first file. I think 22 years ago, which I had in the European Union service, was Kedo. So that was what I would call engagement in a functional cooperation, uh, and that's what we have tried to participate. So it also shows our longstanding engagement uh, in, 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 in the region. <coughs> what I would say what I have personally learned in this last 22 years is that North Korea will probably make no concessions on security as it's perceived by the regime in exchange for economic advantages. Because I think that's not how, this, how the regime works. And I think this is something which we have to factor in into the policy making, that, secure, that providing security for the regime will be a sort of stepping stone in order to come to an agreement. I think that's what we have seen in the in the in the last last years. Now, how we how we get there? I think this is where we are all thinking hard, but I think this is something which we which is a consistent 
pattern uh, of the of the of the last uh, years. On um, on China, well, the European Union has a I would say rather intensive uh, strategic partnership with with uh, with with China. Um, we had not long ago a summit meeting with China, where in our good tradition we have published a policy paper uh, where we also said very clearly that on the one hand China is a systemic competitor where we have to make sure that our interests are maintained but then there are other areas where China is a, f a good partner for functional cooperation. So fighting climate change for example is an issue where China is more and more interested uh, because it feels the need to do it and it gets also the pressure from the people to do it. And I think this is something where we, where we have to see how to, how to balance our principled foreign policy, serving the interest, uh, and, and, and maintaining what I have called before the liberal international order and the basic, the, the basic uh, uh, principles. Of course, we have all learned our, our lessons. I think in 2002, we have supported that China becomes a member of the World Trade Organization, which I think was, after all, a success, uh, because there's more adherence to a rule-based international trading order. But on the other hand, what many liberalists, and I'm talking now in, perhaps in political science uh, uh, terms, had hoped for that economic development will quasi automatically translate into a more democratic regime, that has not happened. We still have an authoritarian regime. I think this, and this is another element which we have to factor into our policy making. For the other partnerships in, in, in Asia, I mean, we have a very close relationship with Japan. We have just concluded an economic partnership agreement which is uh, very deep and, 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 and important, as well as a strategic partnership agreement where Ambassador Nagamine can tell, tell many stories um, as he was involved as a negotiator. But I think this is a very solid uh, relationship which helps and contributes uh, to, the, to the stability in the region. Also, and that, I think that's important, in setting standards. If I, if, if I take, for example, our, our uh, uh, data protection uh, system, which, has been, which is on the way to becoming a world standard. We have already concluded with Japan. Hopefully, we will finish the equivalency agreement with, with the Republic of Korea very soon. So this is standard setting. And I think we will also get others, others on, on board. There's a lot of talk about Indo-Pacific. Well, we don't, we don't call it Indo-Pacific, Indo but we have deepened our relationship with India con considerably, and we have revived uh, that relationship in terms of economy, but also in, 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 in political cooperation, in having uh, strategic um, cons consultations. So, and that was also part of my personal experience. I spent two years on the South China Sea, where we were always giving uh, the, the, the very clear single rule of law has to be uh, respected and the rules of the law of the sea are, are, are quite clear and the decision which was handed down was clear and should be respected. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> when I raised this question, North Korea and China, uh, a session I shared with my friend uh, Professor Dullory, uh, we discussed about the matter of management versus resolution. In other words, when you think of diplomacy, we always try to resolve the situation. But at times, we are confronted with a situation where resolution is not uh, foreseeable in the near future. That you have to focus on management, how to manage the situation. So with that idea, I put open the floor. Uh, now we have 10 minutes, enough to ask discussions from you. Floor is open. Yes. Okay. Would you mind identifying yourself? Uh, 
here. Back here. No, no, no. Ask, ask a question. No, come here. Come here. No, why not? Thanks very much. Uh, John Hudson with the Washington Post. Um, uh, Ambassador Harris, I was wondering on this topic of regional security, if you could help us understand uh, the Trump administration's view on the North Korea's firing of the short-range missiles. You obviously made a, a, a remark about it during the talks, but um, uh, you know, Ambassador Bolton said that there's no doubt that these launches violated UN resolutions. Uh, Trump referred to his own advisors being disturbed by the launches, but that he was not. Um, I'm just wondering what the perspective is of the State Department on the seriousness or the lack of seriousness of the launches and uh, whether or not Ambassador Bolton got ahead of the president on it. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not going to comment or grade uh, John Bolton's uh, homework. Uh, <laughs> if you think he uh, uh, said something ahead of the president, you should ask him and see what he thinks about that. Uh, and I'm certainly not going to insert myself between uh, the National Security Advisor uh, and the President of the United States. Uh, I'll simply say that clearly the United States understands fully uh, the, uh, the type uh, and the, uh, of the weapons that were fired by uh, North Korea and the specificity of them and, and all of that. Uh, but I, I won't discuss intelligence matters here uh, in the room, uh, but I will say that, uh, that we understand what, what North Korea did. Uh, and President Trump uh, is keeping the door open to negotiations uh, despite uh, those uh, uh, missile launches. And, and I think that uh, that speaks uh, volumes uh, to his willingness uh, to continue uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to negotiate uh, with uh, Kim Jong-un uh, as he did in Hanoi and before that in Singapore. Thank you very much. Yes, please, over there. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Colin Zorko with uh, NK News. And uh, my question is for Ambassador Harris. Uh, nice question for me. I've got three, I got three <laughs> other colleagues up here. Well, so. it's about North Korea, so. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well said. OK. So <laughs> on the uh, remains recovery issue, I wanted to know what your expectations were uh, recently for uh, continued cooperation on the uh, recovery of U.S. soldiers' remains from North Korean territory? And uh, what do you think about North Korea's silence on the issue since Hanoi? And do you think that North Korea should continue negotiations on the remains issue regardless of progress on denuclearization? Yeah, so uh, the remains issue is, is clearly a, an important one to the United States uh, and to the Republic here. Uh, it's, uh, it, there's an element of the right thing to do uh, and I think the right thing to do uh, is to return remains uh, when they're found and, and look for ways uh, to continue to search for them, to give closure to the families uh, here uh, and uh, in the United States and in the sending states uh, who still have missing uh, as an outcome of the Korean War. Um, the Singapore summit uh, uh, last year was important uh, in that it established those four pillars uh, and the U.S.-North Korea uh, uh, relationship. You know, the first one was to transform the relationship between the U.S. and North Korea. The second is to work for a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. The third is the denuclearization peace. And the fourth is remains recovery. And then Steve Began has since then, he has uh, introduced this idea of simultaneous and parallel uh, 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 processes. And by that he, he means, we mean that uh, we can continue to have dialogue, we should continue to have dialogue in, in, in parallel with the denuclearization piece on those first, second, and fourth pillars. In other words, we can continue to work to, toward transforming the relationship between the United States and DPRK. We can continue to look for ways uh, to uh, 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 work for a, a peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. The work that's being done between uh, United Nations Command uh, and South Korea uh, in the joint security area for the comprehensive military agreement between South Korea and North Korea is a case in point. That, 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 that work can continue. And then, of course, the remains recovery falls in that category as well. Even though we say that, that um, we'll not have uh, sanctions relief without denuclearization, we can continue to work in the first, second, and fourth pillars. So I, I think it's important 
Uh, North Korea has not responded uh, uh, since uh, Hanoi uh, on that issue, uh, and we continue to hope that they will. Th sure. Sure. I, I think that they haven't uh, responded to South Korea either, though I'll, I'll let the South, the government here respond to that on the issues that they have with North Korea. Uh, I, again, I, I think it's early days yet since Hanoi. Uh, we should give it some time uh, and, uh, um, and, and see how it goes over the course of the summer. Thank you. You have four important ambassadors here. Please take advantage of this occasion. Ask whatever your question you have in your mind. <clears throat> Professor Delory. Thank you, Ambassador. I, I feel badly as, I think, the third American uh, to ask a question, uh, but I will not ask Ambassador Harris. Uh, I, I want to um, actually use Ambassador Ryder's uh, comment, maybe turn it back to you as a question, because um, I share your, your concern that our conversation post Hanoi is too focused on sanctions for nukes, and that, that, that doesn't really fit you know, from general international relations analysis, and specifically with North Korea, that if we continue just in that mode of we'll buy your, your deterrent, that it's gonna work. So I'd be <coughs> curious if you have some more thoughts there in terms of this question of security guarantees to the DPRK. And it's possible that, that European countries, even neutralist countries, present you know, models for, for thinking about how do you convince a country that has the ultimate security guarantee uh, and the only defense treaty ally of China on the planet, you know, how do you convince them, no, there's a, there's a different and better way to guarantee your survival uh, than that nuclear capability? So I wonder if you have some further thoughts there. Well, I think if I have them ready, I probably go to Oslo very soon. <laughs> Um, um, however, I think what uh, I think you 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 framed it well. I think uh, uh, we have to have to make sure, especially in times where communication is going backwards again, for realignment, for refocusing, uh, whatever the, the the exact reasons is, that one always gives the perspective that, as I called it, the door for communication is, is open. And I think if you want to communicate with somebody, and this is uh, communication theory, you, ha you have to figure out where are the common issues? Where are areas where you can agree? Where are areas where you, where, where, where you can talk? And I think if, if this is, and this is part of, 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 of diplomacy, to find these, these areas. And I think the approach probably has to go uh, through creating this security environment in order to allow talks which then go, f go further. And uh, the perspective has to be a clear one. And I think without perspective, it will not work. I mean, what, what, what we have done, and we see how this, how this is transferable, uh, we gave European countries which came out of the, of, the, of the Soviet system, the perspective of becoming a member in the European Union. We gave, and, we, we gave, and, and we still, we are negotiating with quite a few countries to have the perspective of, of becoming a member of the European Union. So they have, a, they have a sort of goal. And they know that they have to work, that they have to, uh, that they have to uh, quite fundamental adaptations in order to reach that goal. Now, if you transfer that to the situation here, I think one has to give a clear picture, a goal, which is an incentive uh, in order to move in, in this direction. And I think there, what I have said, that multilateralism is, pro is probably one of the safety nets, as I called it, uh, which gives also more security. I mean, if you, if you are dependent on one partner only, you are dependent. And we have seen that in a different context. So if you combine um, perspective for security 
with a multi in a multilateral setting, which not only provides you the physical security, but which also gives you then the perspective of economic development. I think this is the only way uh, to, to, to reach uh, this, this goal. And, and, and um, I think in this direction, I hear not enough thinking. And, and, and therefore, I underlined the importance of, of, of multilateralism, which is part of the liberal international order and the rule of, rule of law and confidence, confidence building. So it is a multi-dimensional multi approach to diplomacy, but that's what we actually learn. There are different layers, and you have to play on, both of, on, on, on various layers and not just on one. And I think that's the lesson which we have learned. And I can only say the principle, I think, is also applicable to the region, not a transfer. Thank you very much. Uh, before adjourning this session, let me make a brief comment on North Korea. The security threat to the North Korean regime is not coming from South Korea, it's not coming from America. It's coming from its own system. The North Korean system is controlled maintained by its controlled system. So if it breaks control of the population, the regime will, will face demise. So we cannot think guarantee North Korean security by multilateral setting or bilateral guarantees. The real problem is from North Korea. They have to deal with their own control system. If not, nobody can guarantee their security. So I visit North Korea six times having dealt with North Korean diplomats over for the last 20 years, my real uh, conviction is the security threat North Korea is coming from inside. So with that in mind, we can adjourn the session. Thank you very much with the four representatives and all the audiences. Thank you. <laughs>